The antiques market is cyclical. The collectibles market is linear. Let me state that again. The antiques market, on average, is cyclical. The collectibles market is linear. And that's the topic of today's video, guys. Thank you. Welcome back to Reserved Investments on YouTube. This is a very important topic. Even if you have no interest in learning the greater antiques marketplace and you only care about mass-produced pop culture-based collectibles or other items that are under 100 years of age or less, this video is still very important to understanding one of the concepts that I use when I decide to invest in antiques and or collectibles. I want to put a caveat right in the front of this video stating I do not always think that antiques are a better quote-unquote investment than collectibles. But at the same time, we have to look at the differences between how the antiques market operates versus that of the collectibles market and vice versa. Because there are certain traits that collectibles have that antiques really don't have that appeal to a certain number of either quote-unquote investors, speculators, and even collectors. And there's certain appealing factors of antiques that appeal to hardcore antique enthusiasts that may not be visible in the minds of the average starry-eyed speculator who just wants to go to their local GameStop or Walmart or Target and buy something like this and put it away in their collection and think that it's going to accrue value over the coming years and or decades. Which, as you know if you watch my videos, I'm against that strategy. However, on a side note, if you want to engage in short-term speculation on an item like this, I support you 100% because I do it as well. Then I take the profits from those items and I put them in the other antiques and or collectibles or even the financial markets that I choose to invest in. So that's my kind of secret sauce. That's how I analyze the markets. That's how I make short-term speculation work to my advantage. What I am against, and I don't want to get too off topic on this particular subject matter because I want to go back to talking about the antiques market versus the collectibles market, but I just want to say what I really caution people about is there's a lot of people operating out there in the greater marketplace that think something like a factory sealed copy of Pokemon Omega Ruby for the Nintendo 3DS is going to become highly collectible and sought after 10, 20, 30 years out. That's considered long-term speculation in the collectibles trade. I am against long-term speculation in the collectibles trade for the reasons that I just stated in the beginning of this video. The antiques marketplace is cyclical. The collectibles marketplace is linear. So let's talk about this for a little. What do I mean when I say that? Well, when I started out in the trade in my younger years, back when I was in high school, junior high school, I was able to get in with a certain group of mentors that educated me on certain, how do I want to say this? I don't want to say quote unquote rules, but they were more like fundamentals as to how the antiques and collectibles trade works. And over the years, me being a stubborn smart ass, because that's what I was known as, and still am known as that today at the age of 42, I worked very diligently to prove a lot of my mentors wrong. And every time I would try to violate one of the fundamentals that they taught me, it would end in failure. So as I got older, meaning when I was in my 20s, even in my 30s, I started to accept a lot of the fundamentals, a lot of the lessons that Harry Rinker teaches that I teach on this channel as well, that other people in the greater antiques and collectibles trade who are hardcore investors also live by. I started to really think about those particular lessons, those rules, those fundamentals, and I can't help but agree with all those people because when they taught me these lessons, I was somewhat like some of the people that probably watched this video and roll their eyes and sit there and go, this guy's 42, I really don't care what he's talking about in some of these videos, I just want some of his feedback, but at the same token, I'm not really 100% sold on what his channel is attempting to do in the greater trade. And I understand that mentality, and also even that viewpoint or that perspective, because let's be honest, guys, 
I am not one of the most popular YouTubers out there for a reason. I am creating a channel that has kind of a contrarian and or negative perspective in some of the videos that I produce that is being discussed on the greater antiques and collectibles trade. So, going back to this particular rule, the antique market is cyclical, the collectibles market is linear. Let's analyze this. If we go back to 1998, 1999, even the year 2000, and we look at the greater antiques market, at that time, Victorian era furniture was the biggest seller. If you would go to auction after auction, you would see record prices being paid for Victorian era furniture. Now, before you turn the video off and discuss, let me tell you quickly what Victorian era furniture is in a way you're going to relate to instantaneously. Did you ever see a movie like Underworld and or uh, Interview with the Vampire? The furniture in the background, the gothic style, that's pretty much Victoria era furniture. And for those of you antique purists out there, I know I'm not being very direct in my description of that, but I think we can all agree that Victorian era furniture and gothic era furniture are pretty much similar. So it's almost the same. So that's what Victorian era furniture is. It's very decorative. It's very heavy. It has that kind of old money, old wealth style to it that's popular in a lot of vampire movies and fiction devoted to vampires and that type of subject matter. That said, if we flash forward to today in 2019, the biggest selling furniture pieces in the greater antiques and collectibles trade are either Art Deco pieces and or mid-century modern. If you go to an auction house, and it doesn't matter if you have a signature piece or not, and you say, I want to consign a piece of Victorian era furniture, a smart auctioneer should ask you, why are you selling and do you really need the money? Now you're going to say, well, Sean, wh why would I hold on to a piece of Victorian era furniture that hit its peak in the year 2000 or 1999? Well, the answer is simple, because the antiques market goes in predictable cycles. So it's going to happen if you go back 100 years or even 200 years, you can go all the way back and you can look at the peaks and valleys in the greater market for Victoria era furniture and you can see almost a predictable trend emerges. Every decade or every 20 years, Victorian furniture becomes back in vogue. Now, you can use that to your advantage if you invest, if you collect, and or if you speculate in the greater antiques market. The collectibles marketplace on average, by definition, items that are less than 100 years of age, doesn't have that same track history where you can go back and look at prices. But if you do go back and start to look at prices in the greater collectibles trade, you'll learn something. Most collectibles are not cyclical. They don't come back in vogue. When a collectible uh, market runs its course, it literally dies out and becomes a curiosity. This is something that speculators don't understand. This is why I caution people from going out there and paying $100,000 plus for a BGS 9.0 or 9.5 Alpha Black Lotus or a Beta Lo Black Lotus or a copy of a sticker sealed, factory sealed Super Mario Brothers game graded by WADA or even, I don't care, I'm going to say it, your first edition coveted hollow foil Pokemon cards in PSA 10 condition. Now, I'm not saying those items can't go up in value. But what I am saying is, if we go out 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years in the future, there's going to come a time where those items are going to hit their peak. Once they're at that peak, they're going to start dropping off that peak. And they're never going to reach those peak prices again. I don't care whether you're talking about a prototype rocket firing Boba Fett Star Wars figure that right now is selling for six figures. That item at some point is going to hit a peak. And when it hits that peak, it's going to drop off. It's not going to go back up. It never will. The collectibles marketplace is linear. There was a time when I was studying American glass. This was when I was in my late 20s. Well, the American glass market and even art pottery, if you look at those markets and you go back and you start studying them, those of you that have an interest in this, you're going to see 
those markets go in cycles like this. During the 2008-2009 recession, or great, whatever we're calling it, great recession, what have you, the financial crisis, I was buying a lot of Rookwood art pottery and a lot of Tiffany glass. And a lot of people thought I was insane for doing that. The reason why I did it, because during those that time frame, from 2008 to 2010, a lot of those pieces were depressed in price because wealthy people that had to liquidate assets to come up with cash, they sold some of their antique holdings and the market was saturated. So I was able to spot the trend and me and a couple of other people that I was in contact with at the time would go to auction houses and we would bid on Rookwood Art Pottery, Tiffany Glass, and we would assemble a mass collection that was now, if I would sell it today, I would make an instant 30 to 40 percent because prices were depressed at that time. Now, where am I going with this? Well, if you study those markets, you'll see there's particular uptrends in Tiffany Glass and Rookwood Art Pottery, items of that nature that ebbs and flows. It's because they're antiques, guys. Now, to talk more about collectibles, you have to understand that the collectibles market is and always has been linear. Let me give you some examples here. If we were to go back, and I've said this in other videos, to the 40s, 50s, or 60s, and you were growing up as a kid, you would have a fascination and or nostalgic attachment to Western-based collectibles. Toys based on the Western era, meaning that coveted Wild Wild West motif that we all have in our minds. Um, shows like Gunsmoke, Bonanza, all those shows, Lone Ranger, that stuff was hot. Well, the generations that grew up with those toys wanted them, bought them, and sought them out up until the 1980s. Younger generations were not after Western-based toys and collectibles because they didn't have a nostalgic attachment to those items. So what happened? The market was linear. After a certain point of time, the market became saturated because all those collectors either died off or know they're going to die and sold those items back into the marketplace. Well, supply overtook demand and prices plummeted even on the rarest, quote-unquote, and hardest-to-find items. The same thing happened with Hummels that came out in the 1940s and even, and I've talked a lot about this, pre-Nintendo video games. Go try to sell the Atari games and Commodore games and Intellivision games and ColecoVision games that you bought between the years 1995 and 2005 on the market today. You're going to take substantially a 30 to 70% loss on those items. And if you called it an investment, well, that's a very poor investment compared to other items you could have put your money in. So where am I going with this video? Where is the point? The point is to show the differences between the greater antiques market as a whole and the greater collectibles marketplace. You have to understand that on average, the antiques marketplace goes in predictable cycles. The collectibles marketplace is linear. Now, one caveat on that statement, that doesn't mean that categories and or items that are inside the greater antiques marketplace don't drop in demand and or eventually die out. They do. But if you're going after what I call mainstay antiques, I'm going to do a video on this, and or items that are in what I call investment grade. Remember, investment grade items are considered the top 15 to 10% of the top market, meaning that whole market for antiques that is considered in near mint condition, has provenance, has a lot of collectors that are chasing those particular items, you can actually put your money there for the long term and wait out any depress depressive markets and sell when peaks arise, meaning you can buy low and sell high. And that's the goal if you're going to invest in long-term antiques. Now, does that mean you're not going to make any mistakes? Does that mean certain items aren't going to appreciate like they should or like you think they will? Of course you're going to make mistakes. I make mistakes. I have customers, clients, people that reach out to me. They make mistakes every day. That's how you learn. That's why I said this at the beginning of this channel when I started this channel. The Antiques and Collectibles Marketplace for use of asset, I'm sorry, asset allocation is best used to diversify assets. 
If you want to speculate, speculate in short-term collectibles. Go after an item like this that's $15.99 on a store shelf that you know you could sell for $30 to $40. Go to your flea market if you're lucky enough in 2019 to find the box of Nintendo games or Magic the Gathering cards or Pokemon cards and flip them in the market. But I'm going to give you some great advice. If you really want to know how to identify undervalued items in the greater trade, you're going to have to learn the antiques marketplace. You're going to have to learn the antiques business. The reason being, it takes a person with specialized knowledge and or training. Whether they got that training on their own, they worked with a mentor, or they went out and actually took a financial risk and bought and sold some of these items, that's where that training comes from. That is needed in the greater antiques side of the trade. In the collectibles marketplace, I'm sorry, you don't really need any specialized training besides an understanding of finance, economics, and the analysis and the ability to analyze the collectibles markets that you're operating in. Meaning if you want to start collecting Pokemon cards, and these are all PSA 10 Pokemon cards, guys, and you want to start speculating and investing in these, well, you got to know the market. You can't just go out and start buying this stuff and calling it investment if you don't know what you're doing. Now, the great thing about collectibles is, on average, collectibles markets overall are easier to learn than antique markets. If I would bring out, and I have done this in another video, a piece of Tiffany glass, how do you know it's authentic? How do you know it's original? How do you know it's in near mint condition, mint condition, or just excellent condition, or even good or poor condition? Well, if you have something like this, you've got a third-party grading company that you can send the item to that does all the work for you. There's no secret. When you get to antiques, though, guess what? There's no third-party grading company on average, unless we're talking about coins and currency. And I've said in other videos, you still have to know what you're doing to buy, sell, and invest in those type of items. A lot goes into the value of a coin. It's not just the grade on the holder. Okay, I'll cover that in a separate video. But if you want to learn stuff like American Cut Glass or even vintage advertising, I mean, that's a tremendous risk because there's a lot of fakes. There's a lot of fantasy pieces out there. Any of these markets that are what I call mature collecting markets, what I mean by that are, are markets like coins and currency, historical documents, collectible first edition books, certain high-end pieces of art. You have to have the training and the ability to recognize these items, know that you're not buying a fake, and also be able to authenticate them and or condition grade them. And that's something that a lot of speculators who enter the market, and they do have a mindset where if they can get into the antiques marketplace, they would, but unfortunately... They don't know how it works. And that's why I want to talk a little bit on this channel about how the antiques marketplace works and how it's different and also similar to the greater antiques and collectibles trade. You know, there's a reason why we say antiques and collectibles. Antiques are items that are 100 years of old, of age or older. Collectibles are items that are under 100 years of age, but sell for more than their original retail price. So that's the only point I wanted to convey in this video, and I want to use this video as a segue to talk about these topics more in depth, because I think there's a lot of you out there that may have an interest in antiques, or certain antiques, but I don't think that you guys know how to go about collecting them, and or buying them for investment, and even speculating in that market. And that's okay, because that's a market that takes time to learn, and I can try to teach you the basics. But ultimately, if you want to study something like American glass or items of that nature or furniture, you're going to have to go out and do the research. And that's going to take years, and it's going to take a lot of hands-on experience with those items. So I hope that this video served you well. Um, if not, please leave a message in the comment section so I know to adjust my approach in some of these videos. Um, please consider subscribing, liking the video, sharing the video. And as always, thank you guys, and have a good night.